Thanks everybody for coming out tonight to the first Liberty Pub. Um, I just want. My name is Michael Fuse. I just want to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Ronald Reagan Lecture Series. This is our first um, Liberty Pub event. We typically host Liberty Forum events out in the Loudoun County and Fairfax area, but we are bringing it out to Arlington now. We want to uh, just welcome you all. We have a great first speaker here this evening. Um, just to make you more aware of what we do, we want to offer uh, conservative ideas on an intellectual platform, try to engage on uh, small government, free market ideas, um, arm people to be intellects, um, conservative intellects. So welcome, thanks for turning out. Um, this is Andrea um, Thorn, Thornbeck, Thornock. She's our, our new president. She's running our organization. I'm in public relations. Um, so she will be passing around information on our future events. So just to get into Matt real quick, Matt very generously came out. He's recently launched Free the People organization, um, focused On 2014, Don't Hurt the People came out. If you haven't read it, highly encourage it. Great read, really lays out the ideas of liberty. We're giving away, if you haven't put in for the drawing, we'll be drawing one free signed copy of Free the People and uh, two whiskey glasses with the Constitution and the um, Declaration of Independence inscribed on it at the end. So I won't take any more time. So let's just uh, welcome Matt real quick. Okay, let me ask an uncomfortable question first. How many people here are libertarians? How many people are conservatives? Anybody gonna vote for a Republican no matter who it is? <laughs> now, we're among friends, this is a safe space. I have one more question. Is anybody feeling the burn? One back there, thank you. So I don't wanna talk about any of that because I think politics really screws up people's minds and it divides us and it, it pits us versus them. Instead, I wanna tell a story. In the 1950s, a bunch of students started gathering in Paris to think about ideas and they became entranced with the writings of Karl Marx. And so they started reading Marx and they started reading about the great socialist utopia and how the state might wither away and in its place might happen this beautiful world, this agrarian world where class didn't matter anymore and how much money you had in the bank didn't matter anymore and we didn't even need to exchange goods and services for other stuff. And we could get rid of the bankers, and we could get rid of the structure of production, and we could even get rid of monetary exchange because, of course, money was the root of all evil. And these young students started reading more Marx, and they started gathering and they formed this, this working group. One of these students actually wrote his thesis, his PhD thesis, on this vision of an agrarian society where the people were equal. They came together and they produced food for people. One of those students changed his name to Pol Pot. Pol Pot would go back to his home country of Cambodia and start to work with other socialists and communists to fix, fix his country. And eventually he would take over. In 1975, Pol Pot became the benevolent dictator of the Khmer Rouge. Over the next four years, the Khmer Rouge 
murdered one in every four people in the country of Cambodia. Four years, two million people dead. Think about that for a second. Think about that in the context of your family. In four years losing one fourth of your family. Think about it in the context of your neighborhood. 25% of the people living on your street dead. Now of course some of these guys were murdered. Part of this philosophy of getting to the perfect agrarian society was making sure that outsiders, they called them the other people, these people had no place in this society. And they were shot. And they were assassinated in the killing fields. But most people were not shot. Most people were herded from the cities to communal farms outside where they would produce for the people and they had plans. They had production quotas and they had goals on how much you would need to feed the people. Well, most people died, you, you've heard of the killing fields, right? Most people died pursuing this vision and Pol Pot and his intellectual cadre who were so enamored with these romantic ideas of socialism proceeded to systematically destroy that many people. Same thing, of course, happened in China, where Mao Zedong had a different vision for the perfect society. He thought that China was too agrarian, so he decided that farmers could produce steel. He came up with a plan, and it sounded so awesome, because what if, what if China could take this great leap forward and start competing with the industrialized world. 45 million people starved to death during Mao's experiment with socialism. Of course, you guys probably know about this guy, Joseph Stalin. He murdered a lot more people. He killed about 67 million people. So let's take these numbers and I'm, I'm excluding a lot of very tragic stories about a lot of failed experiments in socialism that mil mil murdered millions and millions and millions of people. But let's take those numbers. And let's very conservatively say that pursuing socialism murdered 100 million people in the 20th century. I think it's many fold more than that. And let's take the bodies of those victims and stack them head to toe, one after the other, and circle the globe. And circle the globe four times with the victims of socialism in practice. Now we're at a bar, and now you guys are deeply bummed out if I've done anything right here. Why am I talking about this? Because as we speak, an avowed socialist who very much respects a lot of these experiments is toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hillary Clinton running to be the next president of the United States. And I worked for Rand Paul in Iowa. Any, anybody still Randing here? Anybody? Particularly now? And a lot of the young people that showed up at Rand Paul's rallies ended up caucusing for Bernie Sanders. Does that seem even slightly strange to you? In the words of the great moral philosopher and Saturday Bowling League champion, Walter Sobchak, what is going on here? How is this even possible that we've forgotten all of these lessons about socialism in practice? I haven't even talked about Venezuela. It's one thing that you can't get toilet paper in Venezuela. You can't get a beer. This is why people are in the streets. People are pissed off because if you want to live in abject poverty, at least get a cold six pack, right? It sort of takes the edge off, takes off the harsher edges of that, of that horrible ideology. 
But here we are in this country, and I think, I think so many young people don't understand what the S word means, right? And I've seen data on this. When you ask people what socialism is, and you're 25 years old, you're likely to say socialism has nothing to do with owning the means of production. We don't, want, we don't support that. We don't want the government to own more stuff. It has nothing to do with price controls and reallocation of resources based on a central plan. They think it means people working together to solve problems. Those of you familiar with the philosophy of liberty, louder, those of you familiar with the philosophy of liberty will recognize people working together to solve problems as the entire basis of our social philosophy and the entire basis of what Hayek talks about when he talks about the spontaneous order and people with all of their personal preferences and local knowledge and desires and hopes for their families and their jobs and the things that they want to do that are fundamentally different than anybody else wants to do and how that all comes together in a way that creates something bigger than any of us could have done by ourselves. It was not produced by a central plan. It was not produced by academics teaching in Paris. It's produced by the genius of local knowledge coming together in voluntary association. But when you talk to young people and you say that, they're like, yeah, that's socialism. That's what socialism is. We hate the crony capitalists and we hate the big banks and we hate, hate the fact that certain investment banks were bailed out because they happened to be friends with a certain committee chairman and other banks went out of business. We hate the fact that, that we're in these endless wars that seem in part driven by the military industrial complex and the financial interests of all of the defense contractors who get these no contract, no, no bid contracts and waste so much money building a machine designed to put us in harm's way. We hate the idea that capitalism isn't really about producing a better product to service consumers' needs, but that capitalism is this idea that if you know the committee chairman, you can get a special regulation or a special earmark or some provision that screws your competitors and allows you to raise prices and screw everybody else. So when young people hear socialism, they hear what we think when we hear capitalism. And when they hear capitalism, they hear what we think when we think government's too damn big. This is not a problem, this is an opportunity. Think about kids today. And I realize that everybody here that's under 50 is a kid to me, so take that as a term of respect and nothing else. You grew up curating everything because of technology. If you hate your boss, you go online and you find a better job. If you hate your friends, you go online on Facebook and find better friends. <laughs> if you hate the news that you see on the TV networks, you curate your own news through multiple sources in a crowdsourced way that gives you access to multiple opinions in real time, knowing full well that one of your friends on Twitter is going to tell you the real story long before CNBC will, or MSNBC or Fox News. You even curate your institutions, institutions like CrossFit, like a million other community gathering places are a direct response to the collapse of old institutional structures that used to tell you what to think and do. So it used to be that there are two flavors of politics, Bob Dole or Jimmy Carter. Not to open a, a sore wound, but try on Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Does anyone feel like they don't quite fit into the two-party duopoly? Well, that's exactly what's happening today because young people don't choose anything 
that way. They don't choose it from the top down. Someone doesn't get to tell you what to think. Your professor, the same professors that were teaching Pol Pot in Paris, used to stand behind a podium and tell you what to think. Check this guy out. Karl Marx has all the answers. Please read it and come back to me with any questions. You guys don't do that. You probably saw Ron Paul quote Ludwig von Mises on a YouTube video and you Googled it, right? Do you guys know who Thomas Massey is? Congressman from Michigan. One of the awesome Tea Party class. Um, he's 36 years old. I deeply resent people that young and successful. <laughs> and he's a very, he's a very well-educated guy. Went to college, went to law school, did very well. Had never, ever heard of the ideas of liberty. Hadn't heard about Adam Smith. He certainly hadn't heard about Ludwig von Mises. And one day when he, when he got out of graduate school, he decided, I, I, wanna, I wanna get involved in politics. And he, he looked at his local Democratic Party in Michigan and said, I'm definitely not one of those guys. But then he looked at his country club Republicans, sort of the establishment guys that were so go along and get along, and he said, you know what? That doesn't seem quite right to me either. So instead of choosing between two things that he didn't like, he Googled it, and he typed in what he thought he was, and up pops Frederick Hayek. When you go into his office today, you walk in the front door of his congressional office, you will see a picture of Carl Menger. Does anyone know who Carl Menger is? If you don't, Google it, because he's a pretty cool guy. He's a founder of the Austrian School of Economics, one of the founders of uh, subjective value theory, one of the guys that, that made such a difference. How on earth did Justin Amash find Carl Menger? He self-curriculated. He taught himself. He decided that his professors, the guys that were telling him what to think, had misled him, and he went and backfilled those bad ideas with good ideas. Now multiply that by how many people are on Facebook today? How many people are on Twitter? How many people have access online? How many people no longer listen to Walter Cronkite? Are you guys old enough to remember Walter Cronkite? Anybody? My wife Terry is. Back in the day, there was 22 minutes of news allocated to every person once a day, and Walter Cronkite was the expert, and he would curate that news for you, and at the end of 22 minutes, he would say, that's the way it is. Imagine today talking to any young person and saying, I've decided for you, I'm gonna give you 22 minutes of information on a daily basis, and that's the way it is. What are, the, what are they gonna say? They're gonna be like, F you, dude. I'm gonna Google it. So this is our opportunity, and I think a lot of the disruption that we're seeing in our politics, where do you think the Tea Party came from? Where do you think the Ron Paul movement came from? Where do you think Justin Amash beating an establishment Republican in a GOP primary without any support from party headquarters, where did all that come from? It's because power and control and money and knowledge and everything that, that was monopolized in those old school institutions, whether it be academia or media or the GOP, is disintermediating back to the end user. This is the opportunity of a lifetime for people that believe in liberty. Now the left does it better than us. And oddly enough, I don't know, Bernie Sanders is like the age of Yoda. So I don't, I don't quite understand how he gets social media, but he knows people, right? He's got an army of young people that not only get yo social media, they, they grew up in it, they live in it. And so they're, they're running this octogenarian old dude that doesn't, he actually, come, come to think of it, he kind of looks like Yoda, doesn't he? And he's waving his fist, Joseph Stalin style, and it's, it's, it's really attractive to young people that are shopping in the political marketplace that feels like a mall in Caracas. There's nothing there. So I'm gonna go with Bernie. 
but we could offer better choices and we could offer better ideas, but I don't think the answer is politics. I've done a lot of politics in my life and politics is a very divisive thing and it forces people into categories that lose the entire nuance of why liberty is so beautiful. I think we gotta go upstream from politics. I think we need to engage people in social media, in culture, where they, where they live and breathe and, and think about values that actually unite us as Americans. Politics doesn't unite us, politics divides us. And if we backfill that stuff, we can have a conversation about socialism that acknowledges just how dangerous it can be, just how disastrous it can be when you come up with these half-baked ideas and combine them with authoritarian power that allows some people to force other people to live the way they wouldn't naturally do. That to me is the opportunity, and I'm not gonna be that bummed about Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Because I think our audience today is a million times bigger than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, Terry hates it when I tell this story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. When I was a kid, back in the day, we walked two miles to school every day and back again. Snow up to here. When I was a kid, I discovered the ideas of liberty reading the liner notes on a vinyl rock album. Some of you have heard about these things. It was an ancient institution. It was almost like a stone tablet that you would carry home from this, this ancient institution called a record store. And you would take it home and you would open this, this cool album and you'd read the liner notes. You're not downloading this stuff. It's, it's very a physical experience. And I bought this album from a band called Rush. Any Rush fans in the house? And it was dedicated to this guy named Ayn Rand. I'm 13 years old, I have no idea who this guy Ayn Rand is. But I remember the name because it sort of sticks out in your brain and I love, I love the album and I love the, the theme of 2112 that talks about the downside of benevolent dictatorship. And I stumbled across a used book and then I stumbled across something else. And eventually through a series of accidents, I discovered the ideas of liberty. I didn't get to do what Justin Amash did. Justin Amash would have never stumbled across a Rush album or a novel by Ayn Rand. He would have opted out. He would have said, look, I, I don't fit. I'm just gonna go about my business and I'm gonna leave politics and ideas to, to other people because I don't fit there. That's not how it is today. So my challenge to everyone here is quite simple. Forget the institutions that we've all built throughout a lifetime. Forget the Republican Party. Forget our best think tanks. Forget our best talking heads. Forget everything that used to tell us what to do and what to think from the top down and own that responsibility for yourself. And I think one of those guys that used to tell us what to think and really energized a generation, including myself, Ronald Reagan, if he was alive today, he would probably recreate the interview he did at Reason Magazine in 1976. If you haven't read this, you need to read it. He's talking about libertarianism and the values of liberty and the traditions of the American experience. And he says, that the heart and soul of conservatism is libertarianism. And it's an understanding that power, concentrated power, concentrated government power is the enemy. And the opposite of that is liberty and people solving problems together and people doing things through entrepreneurship and creativity. That's not so different today. I think the future of politics is a little more libertarian. I think the future of American society is a lot more libertarian. And I don't know about you, but I'm not gonna give up just because Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton are on my TV all the time. 
you guys have the power. Take the power, run with it, fight the power. Thank you very much. Awesome. So, thanks, Matt, very much. First, we have a gift for you. Andrea, since we're the Ronald Reagan Lecture Series in honor of Ronald Reagan, who, in case you don't know, he loved jelly beans. So, and kept a jar on his desk. This is the, authentic, this is the authentic Ronald Reagan jelly bean jar, right? Thank you, Matt. All right. So we have a drawing and some upcoming activities, but first I just want to give one minute to a Second Amendment advocate who has an event coming up. He just wants to take one minute and let you know what's going on. Matthew Bergstrom. Thank you. First of all, congratulations, Ronald Reagan Lecture Series. Great turnout. Good job, uh, Michael and Andre. Uh, I appreciate it. I've supported their events before. I'm Matthew Bergstrom from Arsenal Attorneys. Uh, we handle firearms law in 40 states. I first met Matt Kibbe and uh, his wife Terry in person at NRA headquarters in the basement. It's like we met at the Death Star. But we were at the range. It's a public range at the NRA. And you can go shooting. This is, this, he should be known as Matt Deadeye Kibbe. And Terry had this very zen-like approach. Deep breathing and she hit bullseyes. So it was a great experience. So I'm here tonight to honor them and their work. I know they're busy people who contribute to the cause of liberty. And I want to uh, thank them because you've come to my doorstep. I live maybe half a mile away. And sometimes, frankly, it feels like behind enemy lines. Locally, there's been a couple gun shops opened. They were protested. The landlords were harassed. So my law firm decided, okay, let's give it back to them. So we volunteer to organize a Friends of NRA banquet in June. June 17th at Army Navy Country Club. Uh, I've got a couple flyers left. If you're interested, uh, just let me know. But, um, and a final note, Marble and Rye, if your sliders didn't earn my faithful business, your em complete embrace of every word Matt Kibbe said certainly will earn my loyalty as well. But uh, great to see everyone here tonight, and uh, here's to Liberty. All right, so we're gonna do the drawing real quick, but just to let you know, our upcoming events we have in June, um, if you go on to our Facebook page, Ronald Reagan Lecture Series, we have con former Congressman Frank Wolf. He's going to be speaking on uh, religious persecution in Africa, Boko Haram. So, an interesting talk. In July 9th, we're going to be doing a movie. July 8th, in Arlington, part of the Arlington Forum, we'll be doing a movie screening. Uh, originally, it was going to be on uh, Pope John Paul II liberating Soviet Union. So, we're working on that now, but stay up to date on our Facebook page. In September, we are offering a Constitutional Day picnic, September 17th. And um, that's it for upcoming events, but I encourage you to follow us on our Facebook page for all other Liberty Pub events that will be upcoming throughout the summer. Okay. And then I just want to give one quick minute, I thank you for your time, to Ron Wilcox of uh, the Northern Virginia Tea Party Group. Just want to say a word. Wow. This is awesome. Thanks for coming, and I appreciate uh, the Ronald Reagan Lecture Series sponsoring this uh, great event. And I don't see much gray hair, so it's completely awesome as far as the liberty part of the movement. It's, it's really important. Um, we have a conference this Saturday uh, called the Northern Virginia Regional Tea Party Conference. Um, our basic principles are fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. And we're having a couple of Freedom Work speakers in addition to a number of other topics of interest to activists. And that's it. If you're interested, I've got a flyer and it's on the cheap. Uh, so see me later. Thank you. All right. Real quick, just for our drawing. Um, first drawing is for a signed copy of Matt's book. Um, don't Hurt People, Don't Take Their Stuff, A Libertarian Manifesto. And our winner for that is uh, Adam Kelly. I know I met you. And then, I don't know, the other, the other gift will be two whiskey glasses with the Constitution engraved and the Declaration of Independence, pretty cool. Uh, first one who's drawn, I hope you're here, Cooper Smith. No? 
All right, that's why I draw a second one. Alex Kroll. What? Bailey, Dover, you're the winner. <laughs> so, we'll give you the whiskey glasses. Awesome. So, thank you all for coming. We'll be having another event soon, uh, probably at this same very location. Follow us on Facebook. We'll be putting up the event details. It'll probably be in June. Hopefully June, if not July, working on a few speakers, and I'll be rolling out a bunch of events. Thank you all for coming. And tell your friends. Bring your friends, other liberty-minded speakers. Thank you. Also, if you're interested, we are a nonprofit, very small. Any donations. And also, please tip your server. They've been working their butts off for us. We've overwhelmed them. The bartenders, cash preferred, so they can't keep the government out of their pockets. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions for Matt, he is open for question and answers. We will entertain your questions. <laughs>